God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith this morning. Uh, I'm Richard Harden. I'll be here with you now for the next hour. Today's going to be a different kind of program, so stick around if you're tuning in. First, I want to thank the management of K98 Talk and God for this opportunity to share with you today. It's going to be different in the sense I'm going to be sharing a testimony about how God uh, worked in my life to open my eyes to my spiritual problem after I'd been uh, supposedly a Christian for 20 something years uh, he worked through an interesting set of circumstances in handwriting analysis now, some of you may not have ever heard about that but handwriting analysis or graphology the more technical kind of word for it is based on a combination of of our nervous physical reactions and our emotional responses to words and thoughts we have or emotions we have as we're writing and and certain words influence us more when we're writing than you would actually think they do. Now when a person writes like with a pen and a pencil or something like this I'm talking about writing now okay it shows pressure changes as you know the blood pumps through the hands and uh, things. Your hands are kind of bouncing up and down. You don't realize that and know that though, uh, but but it actually shows different pressure changes, and that you have nervous reactions to uh, and emotional reactions to words that you're writing because those words uh, reflect back in your being as you're writing the word. Uh, like, for example, if you go to write your name, you, you've probably heard through the years when you were younger, people say to you, you know, um, quiet down in there. I can't hear myself think or something like that. Uh, even when we're writing a certain word, uh, the emotions of that word come into us and cause us to react physically in certain ways. What's really strange to me is that we react the same way uh, like my reaction is the same as like your reaction and uh, it's really interesting like this how this works uh, I don't have any idea how the first few analysts figured it figured this out you know back in the late 1800s uh, they were around so few people it, it, it's difficult for me to understand how they figured that a little squiggle or a squirrel in my handwriting meant the same thing as it does in your handwriting because they didn't have that many people that they were meeting in those days to be able to study and project and say, well, this works the same way for everybody. 
But in Psalms 33:15, it does say that God created all of our hearts alike. So there's something common in us like that, that uh, regardless of our color, regardless of where we're born or anything like this, God's created all of our hearts alike. And we have this yearning in us for love, for God, because God is love. And uh, Anyway, this shows up in our handwriting analysis, in the handwriting, you know, as we are writing different things, certain words influence us different as we uh, are trying to emotionally focus on that word and write it. Uh, you don't think about that individually as you're going through it, but, but that's what's happening real fast in your emotional nervous system. Now, with a magnifying glass, you could even pick up pulse rates, nervous shaking of the hands, and, and how certain words you know affect you different than others. And that's how they use it a lot of times for forgery and stuff like this. You know, trying to figure out you know who's actually written you know uh, different articles and papers and things. Now, when I was certified back in the late seventies. There was approximately 270 personal characteristics that uh, could be determined from handwriting. When I'm talking about characteristics, I'm talking about like self-confidence, you know, and uh, uh, honesty, and deceit, different things like this. Now there's over 500. I just don't see how they can get that many out, but, uh, but they can pick them out. In fact, you could you could write a book on any of us by just analyzing a couple of paragraphs of our writing and it'd be very accurate. I'd say probably about 90% uh, at least, you know, from, from my experience since back in 1974 for the last 40 years or so, right before I became a Christian because I came into this handwriting before that and now I'm going to kind of share with you how God used that after 24 years of me being uh, in church, you know, I was in a Baptist children's home for 10 years from age 9 on and then up to about age 33. So about 24 years, I was thinking I was a Christian because when, at age 9, when my aunt had put my sister and me into the Tennessee Baptist children's home in Memphis, the first day it opened, May the 7th, 1950, my birthday was May the 5th, so, um, had a little birthday celebration and went to church on Sunday before going out there and my aunt had told me you know you know the, I need to go forward and tell the preacher I love the Lord and I love Jesus and I wanted to get saved and uh, I didn't know much about what she was talking about because in the flatlands of Missouri out there where I grew up you know uh, we'd see churches and everything but very rarely did we go to a church the only time we'd go was when daddy would uh, take us to church so he could go off drinking somewhere and, and come back and get us but because uh, it was just my dad my sister and myself the three of us living together anyway uh, I went forward at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis Tennessee and then it was the most popular of the biggest Southern Baptist Church and Dr. R.G. Lee was kind of like the patriarch of the Southern Baptist world Answered his questions and we well, went out to the children's home in the afternoon, signed in, come back that night and got baptized. And I was a Christian. So all through my teen years in um, 20s and everything, well, I would, uh, if the if subject ever came up, if I was a Christian or not, I'd say something like, yep, I'm a Christian. I ain't perfect, but I'm a Christian. and uh, And just go on. If some type of convincing or uh, message was given, you know, it kind of touched my heart during church like that, and I felt this desire and need to go forward or something, you know. It was God, I can look back and see now, it was God trying to get me to come forward and surrender my life to Him. You know, I had never done that when I was nine years old. Well, I thought it was God wanting me to preach. <laughs> and, and after been in church so much and uh, preachers I'd met and things like this I decided that you know uh, I didn't particularly care to do that so uh, when I felt these convincing type messages and everything convicting type messages I'd say uh, instead of going forward I'd say well I don't have to preach to be a Christian so I just wouldn't do it well I didn't realize that I'd never surrendered my heart and life to the Lord I'd never 
you know, dealt with the Lord when I was nine years old. All I'd done was just answer the preacher's questions like man told me to, and, that, and I consider myself a Christian because they said that's what it takes to become a Christian. Well, I'd gone to the you know church every time a door was open. I did hear a lot of uh, God's word during those years at children's home and years after when I was in church, and that was good in one way because of, excuse me, That was good in one way because when my problems did come, I had this realization that somehow or another I need to settle the question, is there really a God or not? And, uh, and when I did honestly seek to find that out, the Lord answered me. But uh, after going to all this uh, uh, church out to children's home and everything, a lot of times I'd skip out and walk down the railroad track and go back and hide at home until a busload of kids would come back and hope they hadn't missed me and everything. But I joined the Air Force since I didn't have a family and uh, I needed somewhere to live and, you know, something to do. So I joined the Air Force and I got into electronics and really loved it. Went to night school and the Air Force sent me to college and I got my electrical engineering degree and master's degree in it. Really loved it. Well, I was in, uh, well, I got assigned to Air Force ROTC in Memphis. They decided that uh, ROTC students needed to meet, you know, engineers and different people out in the field for the Air Force uh, to try to motivate them and everything. To, well, I was also assigned there to the ROTC unit as the, what they call admissions counselor. I, I had the state of Arkansas, Mississippi, and Shelby County in Memphis, where I would attend teacher conventions, counselor conventions, and, you know, uh, travel around to high schools and things throughout the states. So I was on the road a lot. This is in I was my late 20s then, and being on the road like that quite a bit, you know, I guess drinking became uh, quite a bit more and more in my life. In early 1974, I was helping a friend that sold RVs, recreational vehicles and campers, uh, to uh, show his equipment at a large RV show at the Memphis Fairgrounds one weekend. I didn't know much about the RVs, but I could, you know, show the people through them, and uh, if they had questions like that that I couldn't answer, I could, you know, always get someone there. Um, that actually worked full time with my friend to you know answer his questions and also the RV company sent down a manufacturer's rep to you know help answer technical questions might need to because you know the business is selling the homes and they want to make sure we answer people's questions correctly and everything well the Saturday morning uh, that I was going down to the fairgrounds and everything to do this I was standing around and I uh, saw this guy come up they said was a manufacturer's rep he and this other guy was talking and laughing about something that happened the night before and uh, how they had kind of shook up an undercover uh, policeman at an all night cafe they were in there uh, and the rep was uh, analyzing the waitress handwriting and this uh kind of like drunk redneck sitting next to him, you know, was saying, oh, you can't analyze my handwriting and everything, you know, and talking like this, uh, really, you know, just rude drunk. But what it was, he was an undercover policeman in there uh, disguised and acting like a drunk redneck looking for, you know, drug trafficking. So when uh, this uh, rep got through analyzing this lady's handwriting well, he turned and asked the policeman for some he, see, he didn't know he was a policeman he said uh, give me some of your handwriting then so when he started uh, analyzing the policeman's handwriting this undercover policeman it showed he had a lot of literary talent and taste and he put on fronts and he was very logical and he was very educated above the average and and, and he started saying these things about this guy that looked like, you know, he just come out of the sticks and, and probably couldn't even 
read or write, let alone you know show all this in his handwriting. The undercover cop had been thinking it was kind of like a joke or something what he had been doing, you know, and analyzing that lady's handwriting. So he got all shook up and stormed out, and they were laughing about it. Now here, I'm an electrical engineer, and I deal with you know. Uh, Oh, derivatives and integrals and differential equations and things like this and here are these two guys standing there laughing about handwriting analysis and you know getting this cop you know kind of shook up and everything well I wouldn't have believed any of that I think I you know think it was crazy except for my curiosity I said well I wrote my name down and handed it to him I said okay what do you what do you see in this and uh, he looked kind of irritated that I interrupted him like that and I was talking. Uh, but he took it and just immediately, in about 15 seconds, he bam, 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 bam. You know, like it said, four things to me that just shook me up so much and everything because uh, I knew that a person couldn't just walk up to me like that and look at me and uh, state these things. And I knew that what he was saying was true. It was, you know, in my heart, I, I knew they were. Well, I decided right then that I wanted to find out about this. Uh, I was shocked, you know, and uh, he didn't guess or hesitate at all. He just went right through it and he handed it back to me. And that was it. And I said, well, what on earth is this? And he's, he said, it's handwriting analysis, uh, graphology. Uh, he told me, he said, you know, there's books on it and everything. So the next week when I was, you know, with the Air Force, I was assigned to travel around. I was in Memphis then, but I had to go to Jackson, Mississippi. Well, I f found a bookstore. First thing when I checked into my hotel and getting ready for the next day. Went and found a book and started that night, you know, studying it and analyzing handwriting. And it just really fascinated me that you could tell that much about people because, you know, uh, especially in sales, there's uh, a guy back in the 50s that made millions of dollars teaching sales classes, and he said, if you know one thing about a prospect, that one thing you can use it, you know, to help make a sale. You know, it was very important in the sales industry and different things, and uh, a lot of people use handwriting analysis now. You know, police departments, insurance companies, and all kind of people. But anyway, all this time drinking and partying. Uh, became a big part of my life, you know, because I was running around in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Tennessee, and away from family and everything, and staying in hotels and everything. But something strange, I, I was analyzing everybody's handwriting, you know. just it, it just fascinated me that you could know that much about people and everything from their handwriting. But something strange started happening that I certainly hadn't expected. During the day, it was kind of, you know, fun to analyze a person's handwriting real quick and you know get to visit with them and friendly away and then just get back in the car and drive off and go somewhere else you know like that well but I was spending my evening in restaurants and bars and dance clubs and stuff and what happened so many of these people seem to be so concerned or almost like dying to have somebody to talk to or something but they didn't know who because you know uh, uh, who do you talk to about these inner feelings like some of you are going through right now inside your heart and everything like that uh, uh, you're holding things in and and you don't really have anybody to talk to and you don't want to take a chance of paying you know a hundred dollars an hour to go see a, a counselor or something like this because you're not sure that you even need counseling in the first place but some of the people, when I would, uh, when these emotions would start coming out or these things would start coming out in their handwriting, uh, they'd just kind of break out crying sometimes, you know, just within minutes after get started, you know. Uh, these deep feelings and things they'd never talked about to anybody, uh, they'd been holding them in, holding them in, and, and all these hurts of the past and things like this, and this talking... Uh, They'd spill out, and uh, almost like when, when you know, I was naturally a, a good listener in those situations because I was kind of controlling it and, and and guiding it, you know, by what I was analyzing in their handwriting. 
and I wasn't interrupting, you know, telling them about myself and everything. Like when you meet somebody and you say, well, I feel bad. And they say, well, I, I felt bad last week too myself. You know, it, it just kind of cuts off you being able to talk that much. But see, I was letting these people just talk as much as they wanted to, and they really did. Well, they'd tell me things that only, only God and them knew. You know, not their husbands or wives or children or anybody like that. They were telling me things that they'd wanted to talk about, but they didn't have any idea of who to talk to or, you know, people that think that's crazy sometimes that some of the things they would tell me that happened in their life. All I knew to do then, you know, being concerned and liking people and everything, all I knew to just do was give them some kind of power of positive thinking or something, you know, like that. Well, things will look up, you know, thank good, you know, all this. And and uh, and that didn't seem to, you know, make much difference, but that's all I knew to do, even after being in church all those years. Well, uh, what happened then was I'd heard so much uh during those years in church and scriptures and everything uh, I really did care for those people and everything so it finally got to where uh, since all this positive thinking I was telling them everything something just kind of caused me to uh, one night to share a scripture with uh, somebody and it looked like they changed right there on the spot almost like you know uh, their countenance changed and everything and I was kind of shocked uh, because the scripture I told them about didn't do that much good for me and everything at that time. So I got to where I'd maybe share another scripture, but it was kind of embarrassing and everything, though, because uh, uh, even being brave enough to share it with them, I tried to keep it quiet enough that nobody else would hear it, you know, like that, you know, in a bar and. It didn't want anybody listening to us sitting over there talking maybe about God or something. It, it was just kind of crazy what was going on. Well, uh, when I would see them kind of sparkle in their eyes, so I, I think what was happening was that they knew that it, I was telling them the truth about the analysis of, you know, their handwriting. And then when I started telling them these little scriptures about their problems, they accepted that as truth, too. It was almost like, you know, uh, uh, since what I'd been telling them was true and they knew that because it was about them, they accepted the scriptures like that, too. And it seemed to change their countenance and they'd seem to be more relaxed and uh, become, you know, more peaceful. And even sometimes... Uh, they didn't even look different. They'd tell me how much I'd helped them and something like this. Maybe just tell them some little scripture or something. And, uh, oh, it meant so much to them. And, and was, you know, like I said, it was even embarrassing because I didn't really want, you know, someone passing by to hear us sitting there talking about the Lord and everything because uh, that just wasn't the way I was then, especially in a bar drinking or something. Now, and what else really ticked me off was, or started you know, getting me upset was that when I shared these scriptures with them, it seemed to make such a difference to them, but it didn't do me any good to the, you know, inside of me that uh, my heart and everything, because see, in those late 20s and everything, the more I was drinking and everything like that, the problems in my life was getting a lot worse and everything. And here, what I was telling them seemed to be doing them some good, but it wasn't doing me any good. And it just kept getting more and more like that and uh, I was so fascinated with analyzing the handwriting I see now God I guess was just sending me people who had problems or something some way or another because uh, uh, he wanted me to see that you know me just talking to him wouldn't help him but it was the scriptures that would but anyway either I got to the point where I had to either stop analyzing the handwriting or uh, continue sharing scriptures that were helping them and, and making me worse because I needed help <laughs> I wasn't getting help from the things I was even sharing with them and uh, so you can see now that what was happening was was really getting me in kind of like a, a spiritual problem or concern or something uh, if God back it up 
back at these things up I was saying to them, but it didn't seem to be doing me any good. And it was about like when uh, God shared his, you know, his word through the donkey to Balaam. Uh, God was, you know, backing up his word then uh, to those people through that donkey. But see, he'll back up his word regardless of who quotes it. And he was backing up his word now uh, through another donkey, me, as I was sharing his word with these people. And it was shocking me how they were responding. And this conflict kept getting a little worse and like that, and my job problems and different things like his family situations uh, looked to me like you know I was headed for kind of a crash myself. And here these people seem to be so blessed by what I was telling them. And then when I talked with some of them uh, later, like one lady I called over the phone about a month later when I passed through Jackson, Mississippi. I'd analyzed her handwriting and she was fixing to leave her husband. She was had her bank account set up and everything and, and he didn't even know that she was fixing to go. And I was scared that I might have, you know, hurt her or, you know, and caused things to, you know, get even worse. But about a month later when I was going through there, I called and you could hear her voice. She was like a different person. She said she and two of her friends went down to the Gulf Coast and took that analysis I gave her and she said she just took it like a puzzle pieces, you know, different characteristics that she hadn't been able to deal with before, but now she could. She understood them, and like that. She came back, and it was like being remarried again, and her husband never even knew they had a problem. Things like that happening, you know, where good things were happening to people, the few that I would meet again or talk to again, and didn't get to talk to very many of them again, but uh, I finally remember one day I was telling my wife, I was talking with her one day, and I said, I just got to go in neutral, you know, and see if I can um, kind of find out what's going on or something. She didn't realize all that was going on in me and everything, but uh, that led to us one night about May the 20th, 21st of 1974. We had a long talk that night, about 2.30 in the morning then, that's when uh, I finally got to where I got on my knees at the couch, and I prayed, asking God's forgiveness of my sins, and I said, God... Uh, you know, asking him to help me. Uh, and if he was really real, I'd even got to the point to where I wasn't even sure he was real or something. And uh, I said, you know, like it just, uh, I don't want it to be my imagination or something like that. Uh, I don't want somebody six months from now to be able to tell me I just had an emotional experience or something like this. And I prayed to him and I said, you know, I'd try to do whatever you say. If, if you just show me you're real, and uh, and you know help me with these things going on in my life and everything. I, I thought I was kind of rededicating my life to the Lord, but I found out real quick that I'd never dedicated my life to the Lord in the first place when I was nine years old. All I did was just went up there and joined the church and answered the questions, answered the preacher's questions properly. Uh, I said, and I'm I even told the Lord in that prayer, said, I'm not going to change anything until I know for sure it's you and you're real in my life and and you asked me to. Uh, I wasn't going to stop drinking, cussing, smoking, any of those things until I could know that it was actually God doing it in my life and I wasn't going to dress up and start going back to church or anything. It's just I was going to, you know, just wait and see what he would do um, and God honored that prayer and I tell you what he he came into my life so strong and everything but one of my things one of my stipulations was that I'm not going to go on just a good feeling uh, it, I got to know that it's you and you're real and, and do these things in a way that you know that I can be assured that it's not just a you know imagination or something uh, well, if that didn't happen, even in my prayer, I mentioned, I said, I'm just going to put aside religion and I'm just going to go out parting with a bang. And then I'll continue in just a second when I get back from these commercials. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube 
and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome back. I'm going to have to speed up here a little bit, I guess, to get this finished today, but uh, what I wanted to share with you. But that night, uh, all these conflicts in my life and everything that... uh, it's happening to me where God's word I was sharing with other people seemed to be really doing thing, good things for them, but my life was getting worse and worse. Well, at my couch at night, I prayed and said, Lord, if you're really real, like that Bible says, you know, uh, show me and forgive me of my sins. I knew I had a lot of sins then, that's for sure. And um, I said, I'll go do and say what you want me to as best I can. If it's just, if I know it's you and you're real. I even got to the point where I kind of even doubted that there may even be a God, you know, that it just might be phony. But anyway, uh, I said, I'm not going to stop any of these things I'm doing, drinking, smoking, cussing, anything like that. I'm not going to start going, you know, pick up a Bible and start going to church again or anything until I know it's you in some way that if you created me, that you, there's got to be a way that you can, you know, um, Come to me and let me know that you're really real without being any type of, you know, just imagination or something like that. I want to know the real thing. Well, and I said, I'm not going to go on a good feeling because, you know, people having good feelings all over town, you know, right now, you know, and just um, I want to know for sure someone, you know, being an engineer and everything, um, I wanted the facts. (laughs) That's kind of a odd prayer and it's surprising me now you know it almost seems like you know it just uh, wondering why he meant to answer it except that it was coming from a true pure I mean a heart of really seeking God and it says uh, you shall seek me with all your heart you know if you know, Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I was truly calling out to him and I meant what I said, honest well next day it was kind of great, peaceful and everything like this and I really felt good too and I said, No, nah, I'm not gonna go on good feelings now. That's ain't got anything to do with it now. Uh, and then finally, you know, I was sitting at the table with my wife and uh, she mentioned something about, you know, we need some family cars, you know, uh uh, the ones we have, the kids are afraid to ride in them, afraid they'll do something and you'll spank them or something. Well, I had a new um, town car and it had special paint even on the outside of it. It was special paint and it just beautiful music and everything. One of the prettiest cars in town. And a um, little 57 red and white Thunderbird, you know, a classic, the 50s. And uh, looked out the window at him, and all of a sudden, as I was looking, I said, yeah, we do. We need family car. And I caught myself, and, what on earth are you saying? And 
here I was agreeing and saying that we need family cars and to get rid of those cars. And those cars were the love of my life. Up until then, all of a sudden it realized inside me, all that desire and love of those cars and everything was gone. And I was agreeing that we do need to get rid of them, get family cars and everything. And I was shocked that I would say that because, you know, uh, you'd have had to really pay me a high price to get either one of those cars or you'd have to steal them or something like that to get them. Uh, or, either, you know, just they were, you know, a big part of my life, man. I really enjoyed those things. But anyway, man, something, something that really changed inside me. But I agreed. That's right. We do. And I wasn't agreeing just to, you know, satisfy her or something like that. I truly in my heart then... When I looked out there, those cars didn't mean anything to me like they did the day before. But I didn't understand it. But anyway, and then uh, soon after that, I don't know what it was that afternoon or the next morning or something, I opened the refrigerator and I uh, saw this three-fourths of a bottle of vodka sitting there. And I would forgot all about it. And I'd been living on about, you know, a, a, almost a bottle of vodka a day or something like that, just keeping a high buzz. And I reached up there and got it, and I smelled it, started to take a drink. No, I don't need that. Just went over and poured it out, and that was it. That was the last of that. And it, it wasn't that, you know, I was doing it to prove anything like that. It just, I didn't want it. And so I did that. But that seemed kind of strange to me, though, that I, I hadn't even got up and had a drink that day or anything. And so, well, then... And I think it was the next day or so, I was waiting in the living room while my wife was fixing lunch. And uh, there was a Bible on, the, you know, the stand, you know, the uh, laying next on the end table. And I picked it up and started flipping through it. And all of a sudden, I started reading some of it. And I was so shocked. It just almost like jumped all over me or something like that. Because all of a sudden, whatever it was I was reading, I don't remember it. You know, now, then, I was so excited and everything, but it it was unbelievable almost how it affected me. And I, I called in there and I said, hey, listen to this. And I'd read my wife something and she said, yeah, it's been there all the time. Something like that, you know, just casually. Uh, I found out later, you know, like that, that, you know, she was she was Christian and everything. And, you know, it, and I remembered seeing her, you know, around reading the Bible and doing things like this, but never meant much to me that but all of a sudden God's word it just I had trouble putting it down it just seemed like it is just so great and that's not something that you know I did just to prove anything to myself or something like that it just came alive to me when I started reading it and then the last thing I had really had some hate in my heart for some people I had so much hate in me, I was almost like controlled by it. And here I'd gone about a day and a half, and uh, I hadn't even thought about these people. And and before that, I was thinking about them almost continually, all day long, every day. You know, I had so much hate and everything. Well, all of a sudden I thought about it, and the first thing I thought about was, wow, boy, they need what I've found. And all of a sudden I realized that all that hate had been removed replaced and now this love for them that they needed what I had found you know I wanted to share with them that's when I knew that somehow that I'd received a changed heart that God was in me because um, that hate was gone so much and I was just controlled by that hate before and it just really it was it was such a great change like that um, and you know this this comes from like it says in you know, Ezekiel thirty six twenty six, where God says, A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. And that was the God speaking through the prophet prophet about the new covenant, the the what he was gonna do and, and changing his relationship with the like he had with the people of the old testament. He he didn't create in them the new heart and everything. When, when they turned to him, uh, they got forgiveness of their sins. He forgave their sins, but they didn't get the changed heart. They didn't get his spirit in them. They didn't become a child of God. And, man, that was so great. When, when 
all of a sudden it dawned on me I didn't have all that hate and everything that I wanted to go share with them what had happened to me and I knew what had happened to me too now and that handwriting analysis would that that led me to this point and everything like that um, I met one lady that uh, had started to kill herself 30 minutes before on the way to work one day and and she just started bawling and crying and everything uh, because when those emotions started coming out she couldn't handle them and and I asked her you know like that uh, when she told me she had started to kill herself now this may sound like a crazy response and it does to me too and everything but I said great and she looked at me and just stopped you know just like that it was like it shocked her that I said great I said are you familiar with the Bible any she said yes I said do you remember near where Jesus says you got to be willing to hate your mom your dad your sister and your brother and all these more than him to come to him she said yeah I said well that's a condition you're in right now you don't see your mom your dad your sister your brother anybody your job friends you don't see anybody worth living for you were ready to kill yourself just a few minutes ago and everything I said why don't you just give the Lord a chance now and see what he can do in your life like it and she prayed with me she prayed with me in, in her shock statement she said oh okay and we prayed there but the people in the store had already you know seen her crying and everything and, and they thought I'd said or done something to her so when they came over she told them said no no she said uh, uh, and then she explained that she started you know just commit suicide on the way to work that day well they you know naturally got someone to take her place there and uh, got her to the doctor and everything well I, I talked to her about a week later she called me and she was like she was a different person that, that had you know changed her life and because she had actually prayed then and received the Lord because she didn't feel like it was anything else worth living for so she turned to him and uh, I've met so many young people even here in Oklahoma City that 23 and 24 and 25 years old like it never set foot in a church before don't have Bibles and everything now, I've, I've gotten a, a Bibles and give to a lot of people here and everything well uh, I was at a dealership, you know, a few months ago, and uh, that was on a Thursday. I remember because, you know, I'd, I started analyzing this woman's handwriting, and the night before, she and some of her uh, supposedly religious friends at church had had some discussions about things, of questions about God and everything. And I was able to share with her there, and, you know, uh, anyway, just help her and lead her. And she prayed right there to receive Christ in her heart as personal Lord and Savior. You know, there's so many people going around with so many things in them. You know, you used to have this bumper sticker, you know, that said, uh, you know, that Christ is the answer. But see, when, when I analyze people's handwriting, I can see what their question is. And it seems like almost everybody has a different question. Some of them are similar, you know, like they have a ex-husband, ex-wife, ex, you know, this or that, that has given them all kind of problems, unforgiveness. Now tell them, you know, in Second Corinthians 2, 10, 11, says forgive others lest you give Satan advantage I said a lot of the problems in your life right now are you're holding that unforgiveness and the devil has advantage in your life even though you may be a Christian and be able to take their problem and share the scriptures and 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 you know deal with their personal problem like that I've had so many good responses and everything and then um, there's you know problems and relationships that uh, in uh, problems and relationship people have that is not really that they don't like each other it's just they get in fusses and fights like for example uh, if like a, a wife is nosy and a husband distrusts people <laughs> that's kind of the situation my wife and I have she asks questions she asks questions about everything like that and um, I grew up you know, in a distrustful you know in the, everybody you know uh, at the children's home you know lying to us and the other kids cheating and things you know it just grew up in an atmosphere that developed a lot of distrust well so when she asked me a question so if she asked it in the wrong way you know it it's like she must be distrusting me or something and I reject you know and, and kind of like don't want to answer or something like this 
But then she just knows he wanting to you know share with me and everything. See, knowing this, we still have a problem like that, and and. I've, I've met so many couples that way where one is real nosy and will drive the other person crazy asking them questions and that person will think well they think I'm you know uh, uh, you know they're distrusting me they don't trust me something like this and and see they're looking at the same thing that happens from different directions and it causes a problem in the marriage or causes a problem in you know r- relationship between parents and children and people like this if if one's always asking questions and say, well, I like to share with you, and you don't like to share back with me. But the other person said, why do you distrust me so much? Why do you ask me all these questions? See, and it's not that either is bad, but people need to realize that you got to work at it, you know, to try to, you know, uh, work these characteristics together that they don't drive you apart, but that you can deal with them because you love each other. And then... Um, for example, like probably about 90% of the people uh, really like emotional appreciation. Like you do something for them, you, you really like, you know, for somebody to, you know, really appreciate what you did and, and things like this. Some people don't like emotional appreciation, though. Uh, boss telling me they're doing a good job and it's just like water off a duck's back. It don't make it much difference to them. They're doing a good job because they like the job or they, they like to try to, you know, do good and things like this. And you get two people together like that, one person in a relationship that that doesn't, you know, crave or need that emotional appreciation, and then you get the other person that does, well, the one that doesn't like it themselves or doesn't need it themselves won't be showing appreciation to the other person that the other person needs, and then pretty soon they will say, well, you don't ever appreciate me, you don't ever seem to appreciate me, something like this, and after so long... I've found that in relationships, that's one of the first things then that leads to, after they've said, you don't appreciate me so much, and, you know, over a period of time, then it becomes, you don't love me. It turns into, you don't love me. And that's one of the reasons we have so many divorces around our country. You know, just mix up in personal characteristics like this that people don't understand how to deal with. One says, you don't love me because you don't show me appreciation. The other one says, well... I do appreciate you. You know I do. And everything like this. And But he doesn't know how to show appreciation. you got to speak it out. you got to say it. He says, I appreciate you. But when you think that, you need to speak it and let the other people know, you know, and deal with it. Because it people do, you know, well, I, I'm, you know, I'm, married a couple one time and analyzed their handwriting ahead of time and that was their big problem is that he didn't need appreciation he was just you know uh, money oriented you know to making money doing a good job and you know climbing the ladder stuff like this there she was you know needing appreciation and everything because she didn't have all those desires for that and um, and I told him I said this would be a big problem now unless I was telling him that you need to, you know, voice that appreciation to her and, you know, let her know and everything. They got divorced within about a year just for that very reason. And I even talked to him again later like that. And, uh, but see, it, it's not so often that these people don't like each other that are going to get a divorce. It's just they're dealing with characteristics that they don't understand are getting crosswise and driving them apart, and they don't know how to deal with it. And um, I've run into a lot of that and been able to help people with that. But uh, I tell you that the greatest thing about all this is <clears throat> I am so thankful and so glad that God spared my life and, and, and used something like this to bring me to a realization that as I was sharing his word with those other people, it was benefiting them, but it wasn't benefiting me. In fact, it was making me worse to see them benefit by something I was sharing that didn't help me any. And uh, receiving that changed heart, when when God changed my heart and, and you know, changed my inward being to not like those cars or crave those cars, fancy cars I had and everything... I knew something in me had really changed. And it wasn't me that did it. 
uh, that's like you know you, you can't just change something because you want to like for example if if your mom's ever told you eat that spinach it's good for you well you might force yourself to eat the spinach and everything but see I'm talking about there's no way you can just inside say oh yeah I love that spinach now because mom told me it's good for me I love it I'm gonna eat it and you know you start eating one of your favorite meal no see it doesn't work like that we can't change our heart we can't change things in us that's what it means when it said only Christ can change our heart only Christ could, could take those phony false desires out of my heart and 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 take that feeling and control they had over me and then uh, when I was uh, sitting there and picked up the Bible and, and just flipped through it and started reading it uh, the next day or so after that and, and the Bible just came alive in me and all of a sudden I, I enjoyed what was there and I wanted to know more and wanted to know more see you can't just make yourself do that you know I tried to read this book uh, Unshackled or something like that last year I don't forget what it is now that thing took me about four months to read it was so boring but it was a good book but it was so boring and so detailed and everything and and see before uh, this change took place in me I'd read maybe one verse a week and, and when I go to church you know like on Sunday night or something like that as a kid I'd say yeah I'm, I read my Bible this week I read one verse just so I could say I read my Bible you know and I don't even know what that verse was you know, I wouldn't know by then, you know, what the verse was. But but now all of a sudden the Bible just came alive in me and, and I just liked it so much, it just meant so much. And you see you can't make yourself be that way, even if you wanted to. Uh if you wanted to, you know, be a good person, if you wanted to make yourself a Christian, you see, only Christ, the living word of God in you, can create in you that, that heart and 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 the reason is then because he is in your heart then. He lives in us. And he loves his word because, you know, he's the one that inspired it to the writers of the Bible and everything. Uh, so Christ in us, our hope of glory, the same living word that, you know, created the universe. God spoke and the living word went forth and said, let there be light. And there was light. And uh, there's my notice that I only got a few more minutes left here. So, uh, receiving that changed heart, like in Ezekiel thirty-six twenty-six, where God spoke through the prophet, said, "A new heart also will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of you, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you." See, when He cleans up the heart and gets all that sin and garbage out of it and everything, creates a new heart and puts in. That's what I was experiencing those few days after that prayer. And then the greatest one was all that hate I'd had for those people. That hate I was just thriving, living, you know, just daily within my heart. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. That hate, all of a sudden it dawned on me a couple of days. I think it was about two days later or something like that. I remember when I thought about it. I was shocked because I hadn't even, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. I went two and a half days without thinking about them. And then when I did, the first thing, they need what I've found. You know, I had this, this love and concern for them because, see, they were like me. Uh, you know, religious in the daytime and then doing all kind of things at nighttime and the things we were doing together and everything. It was just, you know, uh, anyway, that was a problem. But anyway, they needed what I'd found. And I wanted to share with them. And, you know, the Lord, before I left Memphis and, and uh, was transferred out to Oklahoma in the military, I got to witness to each one of those people personally sharing with them about how God had changed my heart. And the last one I was, when I was leaving him, he said, you're just high on the Lord. I said, yes, I am. And, uh, and I didn't... You know, want to go share with them just to be able to sit here and share with you guys that hey, you know, what a great Christian I turned out to be. You know, I went and shared with all these people, and you know, you know that I'd had all this hate for and everything. No, I didn't. I I wanted each of them. I was concerned about them, and I still am. When I go back to Memphis, if I had a chance to share with them, you know, I'd be glad to and everything. But you know, it it 
it made such a difference. A new heart, a changed heart, a changed life. Second, Second Corinthians uh, five seventeen says, "If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature." And and that's what it is. It, it's just we don't have to start going to church and and dressing up and, and you know quit smoking, quit this, and quit drinking, quit this to become a Christian. You can't clean up your life and become a Christian. You can't do it. Only Christ, the living Word of God, can come in and create in us that new heart, a new life. See, Christ is a creating arm of God for anything that's created in this universe. Christ does it. God speaks, and in Christ, the living Word goes forth and creates whatever it is God wants created. And, and Christ, the living word then, is when, when we call out to the Lord for salvation, ask forgiveness of our sin, and invite him to come into our heart and everything, Christ then, his living word is what comes into us. Now, I want to extend to each of you, if you've, if you've heard this and you're kind of curious what kind of things, characteristics you might have in your life and everything, send me a text. And I've got the number at the first part of the broadcast, you know, that, that introduces the program on, you know, Spreaker. But uh, I'll give you my phone number. It's area code 405, then 205-0607. 405 is the area code, and then 205-0607. Text me. Uh, no, but t- take a picture on your phone. Of, of your handwriting, write down. I've got this uh, sentence I like to get you to write. Write down uh, my goal is your goal, like your goal in life or something. So my goal is I would love to be very healthy, rich, and free. Very healthy, rich, and free. Now, uh, if you didn't get that, you know, run the podcast back and copy it. But my goal is I would love to be very healthy, rich, and free. Sign your name under it. Take a picture of it and. Text me that picture or send an email with that picture or something like that. The email's given them a website too at www.raharden.com. But uh, text me a picture of that and I'll either text it back, call you, whatever you prefer, and everything like that. And um, just satisfy your curiosity and see what might happen. But seek the Lord if you have any doubts whatsoever about when you were nine years old when you were you know, young did you really receive the changed heart make sure now that you have say Lord please come into my heart and do whatever needs to be done but let me know for sure that I've received your changed heart back there when I was nine but if I didn't give me your changed heart now create in me the new heart now and I'll go do and say what you want me to. I want to be one of your children. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. <music> 